Let's get this show on the road. So tonight we are lucky to have Dr. Gary Stein with us. He specializes in orthopedic surgery, adult reconstructive surgery, sports medicine, and back care. Dr. Stein has pioneered techniques in hip and knee replacement surgery and has been performing minimally invasive hip replacement, a surgical technique since 2001. Dr. Stein has been in private practice in Santa Rosa for 20 years, and he's active in our community, including the YMCA, the Boys and Girl Club, and the CYO Sports Program. And for over 10 years, Dr. Stein was also the team physician at our local Cardinal Newman High School Sports Program. His recreational hobbies include cycling and water skiing and snow skiing, but most importantly for us, his patients have the most exceptional outcomes and they live without pain. So despite his very busy schedule, and I think he had three surgeries today, we're glad he can make it tonight online and live. So with that, please welcome Dr. Gary Stein. Thank you, Sean, uh, and welcome everybody this evening. We're gonna talk about uh, things that are important to us like your uh, knee and your hip if you have pain. We're gonna talk mostly about lower extremity issues and arthritis. So that's gonna be the primary uh, focus of our talk. Uh, uh, for me, for example, I've actually been here, Sean, for about 30 years. I don't want to say how many more than that, but I've been here quite a while. And I've seen some major changes in how we do uh, you know, joint surgery, especially knee and hip replacements. When I first started practice, people were admitted to the hospital the night before their surgery. And then they would be in the hospital for a week to 10 days for their recovery before they went home. Things have changed tremendously. Now, People can expect to go home either as an outpatient the same day or probably go home within um, one or two days if they stay in the hospital. So the, 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 the methods that we use, the anesthetic techniques uh, and the implants we use and the way we do the surgery in a less invasive fashion has moved that along tremendously. Um, and for example, uh, I can be, a, I can be a, a testament to that myself. Uh, I've had uh, a few orthopedic issues. So I think about four years ago, I fractured both legs skiing at Squaw Valley. Uh, it, in, it was uh, the day after Christmas. Uh, so I had both tibias fractured. I have a rod in one and a plate in the other. And then a year later, I think I had my left hip replaced. Best thing I ever did. I mean, it, 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 I don't even know I have a hip replacement. I'm back to skiing. I, I still snow ski. I water ski. I mount bike. I road bike. And you know it's it's great. I mean, and I'll hear that from my patients frequently. They go, "Wow, it's it's so nice not to have that restriction or that pain anymore." So I guess you could say, you know, not only do I do uh, talk the talk, but you know, I've done the walk. So uh, saying that, uh, I think we were going to talk about some things tonight about how we manage joint repa uh, joint pain, uh, all the way from non-surgical to the surgical methods that we use to alleviate pain and restore people back to their more active lifestyles. So Dr. Stein, that, I just want to remind you to share your screen when you get it. I'm going to share the screen right now. So All here right. we go. Great. So again, your hips may not feel or your knees may not feel like they used to. So our goal is, is to get back to those, those, those days when you could be more active. I think we all, especially those of us that have arthritis, we realize we used to do a whole lot of things. And, and that list of things we used to do has have shrunk a bit and you know you can compromise to a certain point and still be active but when it really starts to interfere with your lifestyle or you have pain at night and you can't do most of the things you want to do well that's when you think about coming to see us and we can hopefully make you better and resolve some of those issues so we're going to talk about knees and your choices for treatment there we're going to talk about hips and your choices for treatment there we're going to talk about empowering your life I'm going to give you some insight on surgery and the recovery process. And then at the end of the talk, I will give you time to answer. Or I mean, I will be available to answer your questions. Uh, so I hopefully we can address most of your questions and your concerns. So joint pain and your life. I mean, what are the symptoms? Uh, many of you probably already have some arthritis symptoms or you wouldn't be attending the seminar, but pain, it can be chronic or it can be acute. It can vary. Some days it can hurt more, other days less. Depends on what you did maybe the day before. Um, your joint may be swelling or you may feel heat in the joint. You notice stiffness. Uh, you might have catching or locking. Uh, you'll have pain sometimes at night. 
And then on the knee, for instance, you may feel some spurs or enlargement of that joint because that's that's what knees do when they become arthritic. They'll they'll enlarge or form some spurs around the uh, joint itself. So what are some of the contributing factors? Well, age is one. Uh, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about that. We all get older, uh, and so those are those you know those things occur, and we've got ways to deal with that. Uh, the other issue is weight. People that carry excess weight, they're going to be more vulnerable. They're going to uh, they're going to be tougher on their joints, and uh, they're going to feel pain when they walk. And not only does somebody that's really overweight wear their joints out quicker, but then when they do have a joint that's compromised, it's going to be more painful because the amount of weight it's carrying, and you're going to have more symptoms. So, if we see patients that are overweight, we really try to get them into a healthier lifestyle uh, with weight reduction. We'll talk about that a little more uh, later. So activities, we try and keep people as active as possible. Sometimes you have to substitute lower impact type activities so you can maintain uh, fitness and cardiovascular health. Um, genetics play a role. Um, uh, you'll find that arthritis tends to sometimes run in families. So if there's a strong family history, you may be more prone to having arthritic joints as you get older. Uh, if you've got some abnormal body structure or anatomy, that can set you up to develop arthritis in your hip or your knee. If you've had trauma or repeated joint injuries, uh, then that will frequently lead to arthritis. And we'll see that in younger individuals uh, that have had traumas to their joints uh, in their 30s or 40s. And uh, younger people sometimes need joint replacement surgery as well in those situations. And then when, when you're having symptoms and you're having chronic pain and you can't do the things you wanna do, people tend to get depressed. And, and that's an issue too that we have to deal with. And then there's the fear of surgery. Uh, obviously nobody really likes to go through surgery, uh, but it's a process that we've made much more uh, palatable, for instance, and people I think uh, get through the process and, and feel pretty positive about their recovery. So there are risks involved and we will talk about that a little later. Um, Arthritis is the leading cause of disability among the elderly population in the United States, and 50 million people in the United States have doctor-diagnosed arthritis. Uh, that's one in over five adults. And how do we diagnose it? Um, uh, Sean, are you trying to reach me for something? No, I was just giving you a thumbs up. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Well, maybe I was talking too fast, but no. Okay, so how do we diagnose arthritis other than your symptoms? I mean, we have the medical history, what, what kind of symptoms you have, what your restrictions are. Uh, then we use diagnostic techniques like x-rays, uh, CAT scan or MRI studies. X-rays are really helpful to show joint space narrowing, especially weight-bearing x-rays in knees. That's a, a critical uh, thing we use. And you can think of degenerative arthritis like just wearing out the, the tires you're the rubber on your tires, you're wearing out the cartilage and you end up with bone on bone, which is kind of like on a tire would be having your steel belts uh, showing on that tire. But anyway, those are the diagnostic studies we use to help, help with the diagnosis. And then laboratory tests are used sometimes for inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid arthritis. That's a smaller segment of arthritis. Most of what we see is degenerative arthritis. And so you're not gonna see abnormal lab tests, but in a rheumatoid inflammatory arthritis, you'll see markers like uh, elevated sed rate, CRP, or rheumatoid factor that can diagnose those. Uh, there's rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, other forms are uh, psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis, there, but that's a small subset in general of the uh, overall arthritis population. Women, for whatever reason, are more increased, more, uh, have an increased risk for arthritis than men, uh, probably, uh, 30 to 40 percent more. Uh, arthritis uh, in the knees is more common than the hips, and we do over 600,000 knee replacements in the United States every year, and we do more than 230,000 hip replacements uh, every year. But so you can see knees are more common than hips as well. So as we said, arthritis affects millions of Americans, and it's a process of, of degeneration of your joint surface or cartilage, a uh, variety of causes, and it can be concentrated to one joint or it can involve multiple joints. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, like I said, is a much smaller percentage. It's chronic, it's inflammatory, 
And it's, it's a process where the, your immune system attacks its own joints. Uh, and the symptoms are usually symmetrical in, in, in multiple joints, not just one knee or one hip. Um, so lifestyle changes. One of the first things we do when we, somebody comes in and they're having joint pain in their hip or their knee is we look at what, what's going on. And if they're overweight, we'll again, try and get them into a healthy diet and a weight reduction program. Uh, diet is the most important factor in weight reduction, cutting the, the sugar, and then the carbs are next, uh, but sugars are, are the first thing you really need to get rid of. And you can maybe cure your diabetes if you're type two diabetes, just by diet. Uh, exercise is second in line. It's a little hard to exercise, you know, when your hip or your knee hurts. So you have to be creative. Uh, typically we recommend a bicycle or a stationary bike. Water, if you can get access to water is a great medium to exercise in if, you're, if you have hip or knee arthritis. You can use hot or cold compresses to help with uh, uh, local symptoms. And then frequently we'll send people to physical therapy. And the role of physical therapy is kind of to teach you how to exercise without further aggravating that joint. Um, also how to maintain your range of motion so that you don't lose motion in that joint. And also uh, to improve your ability to stay active. And then we get into the medications that we will try. Uh, Tylenol is one option. It doesn't work great for joint pain. Then we go to the next category, which are the anti-inflammatories like aspirin or ibuprofen uh, or Aleve, uh, which work well. There are prescription forms of those drugs as well, like Celebrex that work, and they're helpful uh, if your symptoms aren't too severe. Then uh, the next option, if that's not working well enough, there are to try injections. And we'll usually use corticosteroid injections, mostly in the knees. I don't find them that helpful in the hips, uh, but in the knees, that can really help. It reduces the swelling, reduces the inflammation. Um, and, and that can make the joint feel quite a bit better. And a lot of times I will follow that up with uh, hyaluronic acid injections. So you say, well, what's hyaluronic acid? Well, it, it sounds bad. You're gonna put an acid in my joint, but it, it's really not bad. It's what your joint normally has in it to lubricate the joint. It's uh, um, not to be too technical, but it's a, a mucopolysaccharide that has a molecular weight of like 200,000 plus. And it's, it's very viscous, very thick. And it, it works really as a, you know, as a lubricant to your joint. And also it has an anti-inflammatory effect. So we will inject that uh, as well. And, and sometimes it's up to three injections and it's more natural than the, than the cortisone or steroids, and it has the potential to last longer. So some people will get relief for up to six months, uh, at least enough to make it worthwhile. And what, what we're doing by that is maybe avoiding going to the next step, which would be surgery, you know, with a, a joint replacement. So that's an option too, uh, that we frequently use. Um, and I really don't see many side effects from the hyaluronic acid injections. Um, then there are other things that uh, we use for inflammatory like rheumatoid arthritis, like Enbrel, methotrexate, and that's usually prescribed by a rheumatologist. And uh, they, uh, they basically control your immune system uh, to prevent it from attacking your joints is the method that that, that works by. Um, so more, more about your knees and your choices for treatment with the knees. Here's what a healthy knee looks like. Basically has three compartments, medial, lateral, and then patellofemoral under the kneecap. So, and it, this is a knee that's generally got arthritis everywhere. And we'll talk about options for if your joint is just arthritis in one spot, like here or here, then you might be able to resurface just that side of your joint or this part of your joint and not the whole joint. But we'll talk about that a little later. So again, non-surgical treatments, we've kind of talked about all that. Uh, sometimes shoe inserts can help. We tend not to put people in casts or immobilize them. That just con co contributes to stiffness. So that's not really used much. And then if somebody is elderly and we don't want them to fall or we, they need some assistance, uh, we'll give them a cane or a walker. Or frequently I'll tell people, if you're going to get out and hike, just get some, get some trekking poles at REI or Big Five so you can get out there and hike. That can make a huge difference. Um, and then we, uh, again, will sometimes use the injections. So then when all the non-operative methods of treatment aren't working, then we talk about surgery. So sometimes we'll do arthroscopy on a joint if it's the early phase of arthritis. 
uh, and if it's isolated to one spot. You might be able to go over and microfracture the uh, a divot uh, on the joint surface that regenerates some cartilage. It, it restores blood flow, and you might get a layer of what we call fibrocartilage to help with that. Or if there's a meniscal tear, uh, removing a torn piece of meniscus can help too if the joint is not too arthritic. And then sometimes we'll combine that microfracture with biologics like PRP, platelet-rich plasma, that can help uh, the healing process or stimulate cartilage growth. I really haven't found PRP to be tremendously helpful in knees or hips. And I, I did experiment with um, stem cells uh, with injections in knees. And again, I didn't find it helpful and it's quite expensive and it's not covered by, by the insurances or by Medicare. Uh, and you'll see people advertising that they do this and they can restore cartilage and it costs seven to 10 grand. And I just think that that's probably not realistic. And I, I, I you know, there's no hard data that says that's gonna work. So I'd be cautious about that. Uh, so then we get into the <clears throat> surgery uh, arena and we talk about partial knee replacements uh, versus a complete knee replacement. And I like to use the word resurfacing instead of replacement because that's really what we're doing when we're doing a knee replacement. We're not just going in and chop, chop uh, above and below the knee, taking everything out. We are, we have a method of getting into this joint through this side. And we're basically just removing about one centimeter or less of bone, the surface on each side of the joint. And you're resurfacing that joint. You're keeping all of your tendons and muscles. You're keeping most of your ligaments. Uh, and they, uh, really what you're doing is resurfacing the joint. So if we go to the next one, uh, the next slide here, when should you consider surgery? Well, like I said, when all the other non-surgical treatments aren't working and, and you don't want to live in pain or you don't want to live with all the restrictions you may have. So then again, we talked about uh, options and we're going to talk a little bit more here about the joint replacements. So this is a patellofemoral replacement. So this in this picture, this, this knee just has arthritis under the kneecap. The lateral and the medial weight-bearing compartments are pretty healthy. So why do a complete knee when you can just resurface part of it? It's less surgery. You're going to feel like you have a more natural knee, and it's a quicker recovery. So in, in this situation, we just do a patellofemoral replacement. This is what sits on the groove of the femur uh, that the patella rides on. It's inlaid. There's very uh, specialized instrumentation to put this in. Um, and uh, it comes in different sizes, so it's custom fitted to the patient. And then the patella gets resurfaced too. Uh, you cut the underside of it and you put a, a dome-shaped plastic or polyethylene surface on it that, that then slides on this groove on the, on the, on the knee. And um, it's an outpatient procedure. Here is a medial unicompartmental. So this is a joint where just the medial side is worn out. The patellofemoral and the lateral side both look good. This is more the most common unicompartmental we do. Um, because for whatever reason, the medial side is the most common part that wears out in a knee. And again, if the other two parts are healthy, why not just replace this part? So that's what we do. And you can see that it's not a lot of hardware. You're not resecting much bone. You're just resurfacing that portion of the femur and this portion of the tibia. And then it has an insert here that comes in different thicknesses, which is the polyethylene or really specialized plastic that has great wear characteristics. That's what the x-ray looks like. So you can see the lateral side has good joint space. Uh, and again, that's an outpatient procedure. Um, <clears throat> so here's an E where it's more diffuse, all more than one compartment's involved. So here you're gonna resurface again, the whole joint, including the kneecap gets a new surface underneath. Um, so uh, some of you may have heard about robotic assisted surgery uh, that exists. Uh, I have a little bit of a bias about that. I'm not a big advocate. Uh, I think it was introduced uh, more or less uh, as a promotional thing, uh, but nonetheless, it became more and more implemented. Uh, if one company has a robot, then the next company that makes implants wants a robot uh, so they can advertise or market that. Um, I don't think you can trust or substitute a robot for the skill of the surgeon who has experience. Uh, also, we template all, all x-rays uh, digitally uh, so we know what sizes we're gonna anticipate using. We have the full bank of all sizes and shapes that we need in surgery. 
and we have precise instrumentation in surgery, and we use the skill of the surgeon and the experience of the surgeon. I, I think that's the way a majority of hip and knee replacements are done. Robotics, do they have a role? Maybe, but I, I've seen cases that robotics have failed on because you relied on the robot and not your own, you know, your own eyes maybe as much as you should have. So I have seen failures. I've done revisions of robotic failures, but obviously any of us can have failures with the procedures we do. Nothing is always perfect, but implant companies are kind of like the car companies. You have car companies, you have Fords, Chevys, uh, Chrysler's, Toyota's. Well, you've got about four to six major implant companies for hip and knee replacements, and they all advertise. But bottom line is they're all very similar. They all have wheels, a transmission, and a motor. And there are variations of each of those, but basically pretty similar. And the products are very good. All companies make really good products. Uh, I haven't used a product that's had a recall for like 15, 20 years that, uh, that I can think of. Um, hmm. So if you're considering knee replacement, um, you should talk to your surgeon and ask about the risk. He should volunteer those to you. Uh, the risks are low. I mean, basically, it's become such a commonplace procedure, and we take so many precautions that are standardized, that the complication rate is somewhere around 1% or 2%. Some of them are minor, some of them are more serious. Uh, infections, one. Uh, that's less than 1% for sure. But we do everything. We wear a, like a spacesuit, sterilization suit that we're in a bubble. Uh, the environment's obviously sterile. We give you IV antibiotics. We irrigate with antibiotics. And we even put a, a, most of us will put some antibiotic powder in the wound when we close down deep in the subcapsular layer. So that's reduced infection rates tremendously. Blood clots, small risk, but they can be serious, potentially fatal if you have a clot with a pulmonary embolism. When I was in residency, we used aspirin. Then later on, we decided, no, we had to be more aggressive. Then we went to Coumadin. Coumadin has issues with, as a blood thinner. It can cause bleeding, and it's harder to control. Then we used Eliquis. We used uh, Seralto, other more potent anti-inflammatories. I mean, uh, anticoagulants, excuse me, uh, anticoagulants to prevent clots. Well, guess what? We're back to aspirin. That's the standard of care now is using 81 milligrams or a baby aspirin twice a day for around three weeks that's got a better safety profile than all the other more aggressive uh, anticoagulants because they can lead to strokes, bleeding, internal bleeding, not just in the, in the, the uh, implant that we put in or the, the bed of the surgery, but sometimes elsewhere. So anticoagulants are not always benign. So we found a better safety profile with the baby aspirin. And one reason we've been able to go back to that is the surgeries are shorter, People get up, get moving quicker. You'll get up the same day. If your surgery was in the morning, you'll be up on your feet walking. And we use pneumatic compression devices. So all of those things have really reduced uh, the incidence of blood clots. Now, if somebody's got a higher risk factor, like a strong family history of clots, they have what we call latent five factor deficiency, uh, or they've had a history of blood clots, well, then we will use one of the more aggressive ones in those certain situations. But that's a small percentage. Bleeding can occur, but that is rare. Um, I haven't transfused anybody for the last time I can remember. I mean, it's been years since we've had to give somebody a blood transfusion after having a joint replacement. We used to have people even pre-donate blood, so we give them their own blood back, but we don't do that. I mean, we just don't lose blood that much anymore. And we have agents that can help with the clotting during surgery so people don't bleed as much. And again, the techniques have improved. So bleeding has become pretty much a non-issue. Uh, so one of the other things that can happen is sometimes mechanically there's a failure with that implant. Uh, something wasn't maybe exactly perfect. There's some instability, it's loose, uh, or there's a crack in the bone, something that might need, uh, present with the need to go back to surgery to fix that. But those can usually be addressed and, and, and taken care of pretty, in a pretty straightforward fashion. But obviously nobody wants to go back to surgery, but you know, once in a while that happens and we can take care of things. So what's the success rate for knee replacements? Uh, well, knee replacements is the most common joint replacement surgery that we do in the United States. And the, the techniques have improved you know, like tremendously in the, in the past several decades. Um, and 85 to 96% of knee implants last 20 years or longer. 
Now that's pretty good. I mean, they, you know, so that means they can last 30 years, 40 years, but 85 to 96% last 20 years. Sometimes you're unlucky and, and it fails earlier, but that's, that's a statistical average. Um, so let's talk now about hips. Um, this is what a healthy hip looks like. And this is what a hip that's lost some cartilage looks like. And then the x-ray will show narrowing of that joint space. There won't be space between the, the surfaces and frequently it's bone on bone. Sometimes the femoral head is eroded and flattened and you'll see cysts in the bone. It just depends on the magnitude of, of the amount of joint destruction. Uh, again, we start out with non-surgical techniques like we talked about earlier. When that doesn't work, we talk about surgery. Uh, arthroscopy and hips, not helpful for arthritis. Helpful maybe if you have a labral tear and you're a younger individual and there's no joint surface damage in the joint. Uh, you can have pain from a labral tear. Uh, that's the cartilage lip that, uh, that the ligaments are attached to on the margin of the joint surface. Uh, or, we would, uh, or impingement. Sometimes there's a, an impingement there too that you can help arthroscopically. That's, that's for people that, though, that don't have arthritis, but we'll identify those people and get them to the right person to do that if they need that. Biologics, I don't think serve a role in hips. Uh, haven't seen them be helpful. Resurfacing is uh, another type of surgery. It's, instead of a hip replacement, it's called resurfacing, and it was designed so that you remove less bone, but you still had to put an artificial metal surface in the socket or the acetabulum, and you had to cut some of the femoral head away and put a new surface there with a smaller stem. But the surgery actually was a bigger operation than a, than a more contemporary modern hip replacement. It was a bigger incision, much more dissection, more blood loss, and actually a higher failure rate. And, and the amount of bone you're saving is, I think, insignificant. It's, in, it's not bone that's important. So that has fallen out of favor. Partial hip replacements is just replacing one side, usually the, the femoral side or the ball, the head. And that's done for hip fractures. Uh, and, and you'll see that sometimes. Uh, sometimes those can become painful and we have to convert them though to, to a complete hip replacement where we resurface both sides. Um, so again, who should consider surgery? Or when should you consider surgery? Again, when you know, we've talked about that, when, when things are bad enough and nothing else is working. So this is a, a picture of an implant inside uh, the bone. This is a so the acetabulum or socket inside the pelvis. It's made out of titanium or an, a similar metal. Uh, it has a liner, which is polyethylene, very durable cross-link polyethylene that has great wear characteristics. And then the head, which will be either metal or ceramic. It's attached to a stem that's fitted into the canal of the bone. And again, it's a porous surface metal that your bone integrates with. So in hips, we tend not to use any cement. In knees, I didn't mention that, but in knees, we'll use a little cement to uh, fix the implant to the bone. It statistically works great. You can do a non-cemented design for knee too, but in my experience, they've had more problems. And so the, 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 the gold standard is still using cement for knee replacements, but not cement for hip replacements. Again, the same risks apply that we talked about with uh, knee surgery. And uh, we still we use aspirin for those as well. So if some of you have done your research, you, you'll find that there's more, essentially two ways to do a hip. One is anterior, the other is posterior. Uh, the anterior hip is done through the front. Uh, it was more recently popularized and it was advocated because supposedly you can get out of the hospital a little quicker and have fewer restrictions. Um, the posterior uh, uh, incision is just posterior to the greater trochanter, it's about the same size, uh, and it works very well as uh, very well also. Uh, my preference is a posterior hip. Uh, the if you look at the statistics, the risk of complications is generally higher in anterior hips. There's the uh, a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve that gets frequently damaged, and people have paresthesias or pain over that nerve distribution. You've got neurovascular structures that are a little closer to where your incision is. And if you have an intraoperative problem, like say when you're putting that implant in, which goes very tightly into that femoral canal, if you have a fracture, it's a little hard to address and deal with through this approach. How we deal with it is we put a cable around it, the bone and, and a tight cable so that that crack doesn't extend. 
and, and you can still you know, have a solid fit of your implant. So you have to fix a fracture if it occurs, and it's more difficult with this approach in my experience, where a posterior approach is easier access to do that. The important thing is really how that hip behaves down the road. You know, is it durable? Did you get a, the best fit possible? Did you get the right orientation? Is it not gonna loosen? And because that what is that is really what you want. Because the recovery is very similar to both. Uh, an anterior hip might get out of the hospital a few hours quicker, but not always. Uh, uh, and again, the, the precautions for a posterior hip uh, aren't that much more than an anterior hip. Basically, we don't have you bend over and tie your shoes for six weeks, but then there are no restrictions after that. And some people don't even adhere to that restriction for their surgery. So the design of the implants have improved this. The other issue regarding this anterior versus posterior, they said anteriors were less likely to dislocate. The dislocation rate for both of these is extremely low. And I don't know that it's statistically different at this point in time with the contemporary hips that we're doing. Um, for instance, my own hip, I had a posterior hip. I couldn't very well go have an anterior hip if I advocate a posterior uh, incision. So I had mine done, small incision, it's tiny. Was out of the hospital in less than a day and back to work somewhere around two to three weeks. So they both work great. You just wanna do what your surgeon is comfortable with. Uh, <clears throat> again, hip replacements are very common. Uh, it, it's successful in, in relieving hip pain and restoring function. Uh, the resilience and the liability have, have improved greatly. And again, like knees, 80 to 95% of hip implants last 20 years or longer. Uh, so, I mean, if 85 to 95% last 20 years, then a certain percentage of them are going to last even much longer than that. Um, this is one of my patients. Uh, he's a uh, He's had a hip replacement probably about 10 years ago. And you can see he's relatively active here. He jumps off a horse roping calves. Uh, and that's what he likes to do for fun. So the implant technology, uh, it's improved a lot as well. Uh, there are options. One is a metal head on plastic. The other is ceramic on plastic, which is what I favor. I'll talk to you more about that in a minute. The uh, plastic or polyethylene is very highly specialized and doesn't wear. Uh, like the old polyethylene did. And then the porous metal surfaces are designed for bone end growth. Uh, like I said, we still use cement on knees, not much cement on hips. This is an example of a hip implant. This is made out of titanium or tantalum. This is that highly specialized cross-linked polyethylene. This is a cobalt chrome head, this polished head that articulates with that. And then this is modular too. This neck actually fits into this stem. The stem is what adheres to the femur or the bone and it's porous. And again, it locks into the bone. You need a tight press fit to get that to be successful. But these, these come in different offsets, different shapes uh, and angles. So you literally have almost 64 combinations here on each side. So you can really customize the orientation and restore the patient's anatomy and also make sure the hip is stable. We test it on the table with through a range of motion and, and uh, or make sure that we're satisfied that that hip is stable. And we also, these come in different lengths. So you can really make sure you get the leg lengths equal. Nobody likes to walk around in circles. So uh, this is uh, the same implant, except here it's a ceramic head instead of a, a metal head. And I've gone to this because it has uh, a less friction coefficient, less wear on the articular surface here and also you don't get any corrosion between this and the head, which are two different metals. Now this side, you don't get corrosion because this is the same metal. This is titanium, this is titanium. So there's no corrosion issues, but the heads are cobalt chrome, a different alloy. So we call it trunnionosis, but they can get some erosion here that can cause trouble down the road. So ceramic eliminates that issue. So, like we've talked about, we try and educate people on what their options are. Uh, when you're getting ready for surgery, there are several things that are very important. One is you wanna make sure you have a designated caregiver to help you out at home, uh, a spouse, a friend, a relative, a neighbor, somebody that can, you can depend on for a few days. They may not need to be with you every minute of the day or every hour of the day, but they should be there at night for the first few nights to make sure you're safe and, and, then, and then as needed thereafter. Uh, a good home setup is nice, like if you have one level or you can 
stay on one level and not have to do a lot of stairs. If you can have a walk-in shower, that's helpful um, rather than a tub shower, but we can deal with tub showers too. We have transfer chairs and, and ways of dealing with that or grab bars. Um, then the surgical planning process, if you've got some medical issues, we're gonna want you to get clearance from your family physician or your cardiologist if you have a cardiologist to make sure they're comfortable, they have any recommendations on how to best manage your care you know, after uh, your surgery. Wound care, I mean, typically there's not much to do there. We put a dressing on there that you can shower with. It's waterproof, you go home with it. It doesn't come off until we see you in the office uh, 10 to 12 days later. And then we take it off and check your incision. Many times we use glue to close the uh, incisions, uh, a dermabond, so there are no staples removed. In hips, we uh, sometimes use staples, uh, which uh, uh, we take out in the office and uh, just put some steri strips, little strips on there. And you might have to keep that dry for just a few more days before you shower. You can cover it with saran wrap or another thing called press and seal, which you can get at the, uh, the grocery store. So uh, some people get competitive. I mean, everybody competes at a different pace. It kind of depends on what your orientation was before. Uh, you know, you just want to be proactive and do the best you can, but you're going to get there. People are going to recover and they're 95 to 99% of the well are very successful. Um, so success depends on your uh, engagement in the process. Uh, again, the average hospital stay could be outpatient to two days uh, if you need it in the hospital. Um, we start exercise early on. Uh, we also encourage a healthy uh, nutrition and a healthy diet. We will get you into the gym. This is our gym at uh, Sutter. We're on the third floor of the medical office building next to the hospital here at Sutter. And we've got a great rehab gym facility. We've got great therapists um, and uh, uh, physical therapy aides uh, as well. And we've got an equipment, uh, a well-equipped gym with stationary bikes, uh, leg press uh, machines, uh, bands, weights, everything we can think of to help you with your recovery uh, and a staff that's excellent. And so you might go to therapy twice a week for six weeks or less than that. Uh, hips don't tend to need as much therapy. Knees take a little more effort because you got to work on getting your range of motion. Uh, hips are more automatic. The range of motion is a critical thing that we work on over the first few weeks. A uh, bike is a great tool. If you have a bike at home, a stationary bike, that's a great tool. Um, Begin, because we want to get that range of motion before you get, develop scar tissue, which then is a, a problem. Uh, so we encourage light to moderate exercise and, and daily activities as part of the process of recovery. Again, we talked about, I believe, all of these issues. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to ask uh, after the presentation. Um, so Sutter Hospital has done a great job of developing a comprehensive uh, standardized joint replacement, joint care uh, program. Uh, it's seamless uh, from the beginning to the end. You've got a process where people come in now, they have their COVID test before surgery, they get some orientation before surgery to know what to expect. Uh, the process, once you're in the hospital, is very coordinated. They have a staff that's dedicated to joint replacement surgery. They, we work on educating the patient and your family members as far as how to uh, uh, manage uh, the recovery process. Uh, our surgery techniques have improved uh, the recovery process. Pain management is a big improvement. We've seen a huge improvement over the past five to 10 years, especially with knee replacements where we use uh, nerve blocks. We use a, a superficial nerve block in the front of the thigh. You'll typically have your surgery with a spinal. And then in surgery, we inject a, a uh, a block, or by saying by a block, it's numbing medication like Marcaine that uh, that keeps the uh, area numb. We add other agents. We add to that, and we inject the perimeter of the joint uh, at the time of surgery, in addition to the blocks that the anesthesiologist has done, which has made the whole process much less painful. And then the agents we use are not all opiates. We will use acetaminophen, uh, either orally or through your IV, which is Tylenol. We will use Tordol, which is Tordolac, which is a very good anti-inflammatory, again, intravenously. And those are not opiates, so they don't cause constipation. They don't cause dizziness and you know mess with your head. But 
those things don't necessarily cover all the pain. So when we need to, we implement a smaller dose of opioid medication like hydrocodone or oxycodone. And then sometimes some morphine through your IV if you're really having breakthrough pain for the first 12 hours or so. And then when you go home, you continue with an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen frequently, and you will have some pain pills to take as needed. Um, so again, uh, I think the Sutter does a great job with a dedicated unit and staff focused exclusively on joint replacement patients. And they also track our outcomes to uh, find out ways to continually improve uh, our patients' experiences. And again, here's my cowboy. So having said all of that, uh, I am going to open uh, the rest of the evening up for questions. Great. Thank well, th thank you, Dr. Stein. That was great. Um, I just a, a reminder, Dr. Stein is going to answer questions, but even while he's answering them, um, you can still ask them online. So just move your cursor to the very bottom where it says Q&A and click on ask a question and type it in. And let's start, let's start out. We have a lot of good questions, uh, Dr. Stein. And here's our first one. Um, I was recently diagnosed with venous reflux in my lower left calf area. The interior portion of my left knee is also achy and a three out of 10 on the pain scale. Is it possible that my recent diagnosis is causing the knee pain or, the, or is that possibly separate? There's no evidence of ACL tear or other common knee diagnosis. Thank you. Well, if your tenderness is right along the joint line, is the tenderness, uh, I guess if the tenderness was posterior, say in your, in your popliteal area and that where the veins are, which is the back of the knee, that could be related to the venous uh, issue because uh, you will have sometimes pain in the posterior or the back of the knee. If it's more along the joint line, uh, like medial, lateral, or an anterior, like you said, it's medial. So if it's just directly medial, there's probably something in your knee that's causing that. It, it, it might be a meniscus tear. I don't know if you've had an MRI. It could be a, a early onset arthritis, a mild form of arthritis. So it, it could be, you know, something in the joint. If it's truly at the joint line, your, and your doctor should be able to, de to determine that. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, um, I am obese, currently weigh 267 and have been losing weight, down from 389 pounds um, for four years. Um, while while I've, I've kept it off, uh, I remain in the obese category. Can I still get a much needed knee replacement surgery? Uh, possibly, I mean, that's great. You've done, I mean, that's, that's commendable that you've managed to lose that much weight and uh, keep at it. But uh, it depends on how tall you are too. So we have a, a, a number called your BMI, which is based on your height versus your weight. And we like that BMI to be 40 or lower uh, to do your surgery. So it, it could be that you're in the category where you could safely have it. Great, thank you. Next question, this is kind of specific, but I'm sure you, you can answer it. Um, is there an exercise that can help right hip pain that gets worse when sitting and radiate, radiates somewhat down the knee? Lying on the floor and crossing my right leg over the left with my right ankle on the left knee and gently pushing on the right knee is the only thing that helps. That's Would a hard I, one. I, 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 uh, not sure. Uh, the hip pain, is it, is it anterior, posterior? What, what part of the hip hurts? Well, I, 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 it's just a typed in question, so I can't ask it directly. Yeah, I mean, if, if the pain's anterior, uh, I think a stretch like that can help if it's coming from your hip joint. Now, if the pain is in the buttock or your, the posterior aspect of your hip, sometimes that's really not your hip joint. That could be your spine because uh, uh, it's not unusual to see an overlap. I've seen people come in with uh, having been treated for their lower back for a disc problem when the real problem was their hip uh, because the, the, the pain from the spine will go into the posterior aspect of the hip. Nonetheless, I'll also see people with hip pain complaints. And if the pain is posterior, well, frequently it's not their hip joint, it's the the spine. So if it's an anterior pain in the front or the lateral side, like over your hip bursa laterally, that, that maneuver can help. It stretches. And so a stretch can make it more comfortable. <clears throat> but I don't know how much lasting relief you get with that. But th that could be an indicator of, of, of hip joint arthritis. Um, but if the pain, again, is more posterior, then you have to think about a possible problem in your low back. 
Okay, and there was a follow-up to that question. Uh, would, would cortisone possibly help? Uh, we use cortisone if the pain is lateral over your, over your bursa, where you feel the side of your hip, uh, there's called a trochanteric bursa. It's the bony prominence that projects laterally uh, out from your hip. And there's a bursa there. And people will come in with pain localized to that area, and we do cortisone for that. Uh, I mentioned earlier in my talk that putting cortisone in the joint Eh, I don't feel like it's that helpful in hips. It gives relief for about a month at the most. Uh, I usually reserve that for people to say, I've got a trip plan. I'm going to be doing a lot of hiking. I've got a wedding plan that I got to be able to function better. I just need some temporary relief. And so we'll do hip injections uh, for that in the joint. Uh, uh, that's in the actual joint, as opposed to a, an injection on the side, where if it's bursitis pain, that we do in the office and, and that can help that problem. Great, thank you very much. This next question um, I can answer. Uh, will we get copies of these slides? I would really like them. So the answer is if you, when the form pops up, um, just uh, um, just indicate that you'd like a copy of the video and we'll, uh, we'll send that to you. Uh, so that's no problem. So our next question um, is, um, uh, can you do a knee replacement as an outpatient procedure? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can do partial outpatient, uh, partial replacements outpatient. You can do a complete knee replacement as an outpatient. You can go home the same day. Uh, technically, Medicare and some of the insurance companies consider a less than 24 hour stay outpatient. So say uh, you have your surgery in the afternoon and you don't really wanna go home late in the evening, you can spend the night and go home the next morning. Uh, and if it's less than 24 hours, it's still considered outpatient. Uh, but you can go home the same day as well. Depends on a couple of things. I mean, you know, if you're uh, in good physical shape and don't want to have a lot of other issues, uh, you're not way overweight. Uh, if you uh, have not been taking pain medicine and you're, you know, you're relatively tough and sort of on the athletic side without a lot of medical issues, then you can go home the same day. And especially if you've got somebody there that's uh, good to help you out at home. Great. Um, next question is, I have a history of right knee arthritis between the patella and femur, two surgeries, lateral release plus MPFL reconstruction and recent tibial osteo osteotomy with MACI procedure. Are surgeries that only include the patella and femur common, are these patients able to return to more active lifestyle? Uh, it's not real common. Like I think we, I did talk about it. Uh, you know, we talked about patellofemoral uh, partial knee replacements versus medial. Medial is more common, but patellofemoral, I do, I do them, I do them every few months. I'll do some of uh, one or two of those, uh, and they work well, and they're good if your arthritis again is just isolated to the patellofemoral compartment and not the rest of the knee, uh, and that's. Uh, it, it, they, you can expect to go back to being really active. I have patients that are big hikers in the Sierras. I have patients that play tennis with, uh, with a partial knee replacement with the patellofemoral joint. So I, I think it's very successful. And if you don't need a total knee, it's a great option. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, will hyaluronic acid injections help with known knee narrowing medially, laterally and centrally? No, uh, it doesn't grow cartilage. So it's not going to increase that joint space. Uh, it's just to relieve symptoms. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything out there that really grows cartilage. I mean, you'll see, like I said, people uh, advocate or advertise that they can do stem cell injections, cost a lot of money. And there's a reason why no insurance pays pay for it because it's not really proven that it works. And it depends. I mean, if your arthritis is minimal, having a stem cells or biologics might beef up your cartilage response. But if you've got significant cartilage loss where it's mostly gone, I don't think anything's going to put it back. And then again, the hyaluronic acid doesn't either, but it just relieves symptoms. Okay, thank you. Next question is, I have knee pain when climbing stairs after arthroscopic surgery to clean out the joint. Will that go away as I recover? Depends on how long it's been. I mean, like you got to give a, an arthroscopic procedure about three months to determine whether it's helped you. So if you're still early on, it may still get better. But after three months, if you've had an arthroscopic procedure and your knee's still hurting, it, it's probably not gonna get better. Uh, it depends too what the surgeon found when he was in there. If he found like, oh, well, there was some arthritis, we cleaned it up, so to speak, 
but you know they can't put cartilage back and so there was if there was enough surface damage on your joint surfaces then yeah it may not get better and so then you may have to look at one of the next options and sometimes when people don't look like they're ready for a knee replacement we will scope it first to see if there's something we can do because yeah it's a minor procedure but if it doesn't work we know that the next step may be a joint replacement but if i see a patient and i can de determine from an mri or the x-rays that there's a significant amount of arthritis there i tell them that i don't think a scope is going to be helpful um, and i don't push that uh, because i don't feel like you know they're, they're going to benefit if there's a lot of arthritis in your joint a scope's not going to do much great next question is i have a torn meniscus the mri shows that it is a bad tear what kind of success can I expect if I have an arthro arthroscopy? I have minimal arthritis, but I don't want to have surgery if there is no assurance that my pain and range of motion will improve. Uh, well, we don't have any guarantees in medicine, but no, I'm just <laughs> kidding. But uh, it depends a little bit on uh, uh, what that tear is like. Uh, you know, if you just have a, a little degenerative tear, or, uh, I don't know that it needs to be scoped. If you've got a significant tear, you know, it depends on what your MRI looks like. If it shows uh, a tear that is unstable, like there's a piece of that meniscus that's moving out of place, it's, it, it, and it's causing catching, locking, or sharp pain type symptoms, then, then doing a partial removal of that meniscus and smoothing, uh, and then beveling and making the transition smooth to the remaining cartilage can make a huge difference. So in the right situation without much arthritis and a torn meniscus, cartilage, uh, arthroscopic surgery is usually successful. I'd say 80% of the time. Great, thank you. Next question is, does hyaluronic acid work the same on knees as it does hips? Uh, it works on knees. It's not really used in hips much. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's primarily designed for knees. So we use the hyaluronic acid in knees. It, it, hips, it's pretty much off label to use it in hips. Next question is, I have a pain similar to a growing pull with every step I take on a daily walk. Is it likely that it is caused by my hip? Uh, can you repeat that? Yeah, I have a pain similar to a, it says growing pull with every step. A groin pull. Yeah, oh, a groin pull, okay, sorry. Uh, with every step I, uh, I take on a daily walk, is that likely caused by my hip? Yes. The most common area that we symptoms with hip arthritis is in the groin. Uh, so th that's, if it's in the groin, that's very likely could be your hip because that's usually where it presents. It will hurt in the groin. You'll have pain sometimes down the thigh and then you'll have pain like between your uh, gluteus and the groin, you know, down deep. But hip pain frequently is more anterior in the groin region. Great. Next question is, um, some, sometimes I get a pain in what feels like the outside of my hip. It feels like a ligament may be moving around or slipping. Is this possible? My hip has never been broken or damaged and this happens only in one hip. Yeah, probably what that is, is your iliotibial band. Uh, there's a band that goes from the top of your pelvis, the ilium, all the way down to your knee. And it's, it's like a fascial band. And when you flex and extend your hip, it slides over the, the trochanter, which is that bony prominence on the lateral side of your hip. And, <clears throat> and sometimes that's a friction point. Some people will say it's, uh, it snaps or it's actually sometimes called a snapping hip because that tendon, when it glides back and forth, it, it catches or it snaps. If it doesn't hurt, don't worry about it. I mean, if you have pain, well, you can have a cortisone injection. Sometimes that'll help. Sometimes physical therapy will help. Rarely we do surgery for that. I don't have a lot of experience doing that procedure, but I have a, a fellow that I send people to that if they really need something for that, uh, it will, he does that surgery. He does hip arthroscopies and some of that type of, of surgery, but less, it's a less common procedure. Great. But again, it, 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 that's probably what it is. It's probably your iliotibial band. It's probably just sliding over the bone. It's annoying maybe, but yeah, if it doesn't hurt, I wouldn't do anything about it. But Thank if it does you. hurt, you could try the injection, physical therapy, and last resort would be surgery. Terrific. Uh, next one is, um, I have osteoarthritis in both knees and one hip. I assume I will need surgery on all, but where do I start? Knees are quite bad, and I have a considerable pain on stairs, so I avoid them. Does knee replacement treatment alleviate this problem? Hip pain is bad if I stand for any length of time. 
his last part. I'm 77 years old and currently not going much of anywhere due to COVID. So I've not recently seen an orthopedic doctor. What would you recommend? I recommend you come into my office if you need three joint replacements. I'm just kidding you. <laughs> but uh, that, uh, and that's frequently what we see is, uh, uh, you know, a combination. It's not always just a hip and a knee. I mean, just a hip or just a knee. Um, usually, and it depends again on how bad your arthritis is in, in, in those joints, but Typically, the hip is more problematic than the knees. It tends to cause more uh, dysfunction uh, and more pain. And again, it, especially if it's on the same side, uh, the same nerve that supplies the hip supplies the knee, the femoral nerve. So sometimes you'll get a referred pain from the hip all the way into the knee. So some of your knee pain may actually be originating from the hip. Uh, so if I see somebody and they've got about the same amount of arthritis, say in the knee and the hip, I'll do the hip first because I think that will improve their function the quickest. And then if they continue to have knee pain, then we'll go do maybe one knee and then if necessary, do the other knee. I mean, we, we, would, we would do one surgery at a time typically and let you get your recovery. And, and, you're, and once you're happy with that and you say, hey, I, I really now want to get my knee fixed, well, then we can do that. But I never tell somebody they have to have surgery. It's your decision. It's the, pers it's the patient's individual decision. I offer options. And I try to explain what you can expect to achieve with surgery. And, and really, it's, it's, the, it's the patient's decision when he says, well, yeah, I, knowing all that, I, I think I'm, I'm ready to do something. So, uh, but again, I would probably do the hip first and then the knee. And, uh, and as far as multiple surgeries at once, uh, I don't do both hips at once. Some people have and do. It's not real common. Uh, both knees, I will do both knees at once on the right individual. Again, if they don't have uh, a lot of other issues that would make their recovery harder and they're relatively tough and they go like, I just want to get it done. I want to get it done with one anesthesia, one recovery period. Then I'll do both knees at once if they need it. Great. Um, this is a combination of a couple of different folks' questions. Um, how many times can I have cortisone injections? I seem to work for, but only for about two to three months. Is there a limit to this type of therapy? Uh, not in some situations, yes. Like in a younger individual, uh, and say your joint's not completely shot, uh, I would not do cortisone repeatedly because it does have some adverse effects on the health of your cartilage. It makes the pain go away. It reduces the inflammation, but it also uh, has an effect on, on on the health of your cartilage. It reduces the metabolic activity of your cartilage cells, so they can't repair themselves very well. And so if you do a lot of cortisone, it might actually accelerate the wear in the joint. Uh, <clears throat> so in a younger individual with not real advanced arthritis, I will try not to do that much in, of a cortisone injection, maybe once every six months, once a year, if they get good relief with it. Now, that's the younger person with the moderate arthritis. You get to the older person who uh, maybe isn't a surgical candidate. They're 85, 90 years old or older, and they've got medical issues where they just don't want to have surgery or maybe shouldn't have surgery. Well, then I'll give it, I'll give cortisone every three months. I mean, if it makes their life better. So, and if their joints pretty well, you know, uh, arthritic, well, there aren't any other options. So, and I'll do that with hyaluronic acid. I'll, I'll do both. I'll do the cortisone and then the hyaluronic acid to help uh, mitigate their symptoms and uh, that, so that they can live with it. Uh, so, in that group, we'll do them repeatedly. So it kind of just depends on the individual situation. Great. I'm, I'm not sure this is the spell checker doing it wrong, but I'll read what it's written here. Um, I have a derangement of the post horn of my right knee, which stays non-painful as long as I don't walk too fast, avoid squats and mostly avoid stairs. I'm 58 and wonder if I just have to accept this as my new lifestyle and tear it, until it deteriorates f further. Well, I mean, that's kind of a personal choice. Uh, again, it bothers you with certain activities, but not everything. And so if you're willing to compromise and it doesn't hurt, then I wouldn't do anything. Uh, if, it's an, if it's a small tear and it's, it, it may be the cause of your pain, I mean, uh, you can take 10 people off the street that are age 58 and get MRIs. And the MRI is going to be read as something like a small tear or degenerative tear, even if you're not having symptoms. So sometimes what you see on the MRI doesn't necessarily always correlate with what's going on. Uh, but if there is no arthritis and you've just got a posterior horn meniscus tear, uh, 
it, it can be fixed uh, arthroscopically if it bothers you enough. Uh, there's a, a reasonable chance that a scope could make it better. But again, that's really a personal choice. If you say, hey, it, it doesn't bother me that much, I can live with it, then fine. I mean, delaying surgery or not doing the surgery, I don't think has any adverse effects. Like you say, oh, geez, if I don't do something now, it's going to get worse and it's going to be a big problem. No, I would base whether you have a, that knee scoped on how bad the symptoms are and how, how much it's bothering you. And, and not because, oh, I got to do something before it gets worse. No, I, I don't think that the surgery is going to serve that purpose of preventing a, a progression of, of arthritis in that situation. Thank you. Um, next question is, I have a leg length irregularity of two and five eighths inches and have hip pain. I was told that during hip replacement, a portion of the leg can be cut back. Is that an option with hip surgery? Yeah, it's uh, definitely easier to add length than subtract, and we can. So two and a half inches or two and five eighths is a big discrepancy. That's a little too much for us to gain back. <clears throat> I'd say uh, one and a half to two inches is the upper limit. Uh, part of that reason is your muscles and tendons are not going to allow us to stretch it that far. And the other issue is that we can't stretch the sciatic nerve and the femoral nerve that much because then that could damage the nerve. So you'll get half or more of that discrepancy back, which would be helpful. Great. Um, this is more of a comment than a uh, question, but I'll read it anyway. Nice presentation, Dr. Stein. I'm doing physical therapy exercises three times a week and use acupuncture for pain. I have arthritis secondary to a patella fracture uh, and repair seven years ago. I'm working at staying out of surgery, but after hearing your great talk, I feel hopeful if all else fails. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Um, the uh, next question is, um, are you doing surgery during the coronavirus? Is it safe to be in the hospital now? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, early on during the pandemic, we weren't doing elective surgeries for probably about two months or so. It was April, May, and, and June. And then we've been doing them since then. I mean, patients get routinely screened. Uh, they get a COVID test uh, two days before their surgery and then quarantine before their surgery. Um, and uh, uh, most of our surgeries are not in the hospital very long. Obviously, we take precautions. Uh, you, you know, it's a very sterile environment. People are wearing face coverings. We're wearing space suits. Uh, so I have had nobody contract um, uh, coronavirus with their surgeries uh, and everybody gets screened. And like today I did three joint replacements. Tomorrow I have six that I'm gonna be doing. So we are now back in full steam. Uh, I think people deferred their surgery for a while, which was reasonable. If you have a really high health risk comorbidities, well then maybe you should wait, especially now that you know the vaccine is right around the corner. Uh, but no, we are, we are doing cases and we haven't had a problem. Great. Uh, thank you. Next question is my knees click when I bend them. Is that an indication of arthritis? Not necessarily. Uh, joints make noise. It doesn't hurt. I don't worry about it. Uh, if it, you know, it doesn't hurt, doesn't swell. A little noise is not necessarily bad. I mean, even young people's knees will sometimes make noise. Uh, it, it just varies. Great. This is an, uh, I think you may have answered this, but I'll ask it anyway. I'm 71 with two bad knees, but otherwise in good health. Can a 71 year old get both knees replaced at the same time to avoid having to recover twice? Uh, yeah, but we might have to give you more than a bullet to bite on if you do both. <laughs> but uh, if you're tough and you're good health and you're gonna, you know, sort of athletic type individual, yes, you can do both at once. Great. Uh, next question is for knee issues, pain and eventual replacement, what determines giving a cortisone shot versus hyaluronic acid? Uh, uh, repeat that again, Sean. Uh, for knee issues, pain with maybe an eventual replacement, what determines giving a cortisone shot versus hyaluronic acid? Uh, usually what I will do uh, when I see uh, initially, well, I, I will do a cortisone shot first because what it does is it just brings down the inflammation and any swelling that's in the joint. Uh, and then I'll follow up that like two or three weeks later with the hyaluronic because the hyaluronic acid will work better if there's not an effusion or a lot of fluid in the joint because then it's, it's diluted. So you want it to work in its full effect. So I will typically start with a cortisone injection first and then follow up with uh, the three uh, hyaluronic injections like three weeks later. Great. 
Next question is, how long would it take to schedule a surgery um, once you decide on it? Uh, it depends. If you're healthy and don't need a lot of preoperative screening, like cardiac workup, et cetera, uh, one to two months. Uh, and if, if you have some issues that need to be addressed, it might take a little longer, two to three months to, to get your surgery. Great. Uh, next question is, what is your experience with USDA certified CBD oil? Uh, uh, mixed. Uh, I don't uh, prescribe it because people buy it, you know, over the counter, but uh, some people say it helps and some people say it doesn't. I think it's a trial and error sort of thing. The other topical that I encourage people to try is uh, diclofenac cream, which is Voltaren gel. Uh, it's over the counter. It used to be prescription. Uh, it's an anti-inflammatory. That's a prescription pill that we give people, diclofenac or Voltaren, but it comes in a topical form that you rub on a joint. Uh, that you can buy over the counter. And it, it, it penetrates the, uh, the skin and tissues and can get into the joint and provide some relief. It's a little better uh, on a topical situation like a hand or a thumb uh, that's not a real deep joint. But nonetheless, people sometimes will find it helpful in a knee, probably not a hip. Very good. Um, next question is, can I come see you directly or do I need a referral from my primary care doctor? Uh, that depends on your insurance. Uh, if you're in an HMO that says everything has to go through your primary care with a referral, then yeah, you have to go that route. Uh, if you don't, then yeah, you can just call and make an appointment. I mean, we don't require that you be referred by a family doctor or your personal doctor. We're, we're, we're available for appointments. So it's just the only reason you would have to do that is if your insurance required it. Great. Uh, next question is, I have arthritis in both knees uh, and one hip, how do I decide which one would be addressed first? Uh, I think I answered that question earlier. It's like, it, it depends on which one hurts the most, but if, if they're all about the same, I would do the hip first because I think the hip is a bigger problem. And then I would do the knees after that, depending on which one bothers you the most. And, some, you and, and, and the x-ray findings might determine that a little bit too. I mean, how bad your x-rays look on each one of those joints. Great. Uh, next one is, I have two discs in my lower back that slip around. Can this be causing my knee pain? Probably not. It depends on where your knee pain is. Now, if the pain is, is going like from your back into your buttock and down the posterior thigh and in the back of the knee and down the leg, uh, yeah, that could be your disc and a pinched nerve, sciatica. Mm. But if it's all around the knee uh, and your knee has any swelling for sure, then it's the knee or, you know, but it, it would just be posterior pain. It should radiate, you know, all the way up and down your leg. If it's from your discs, if it's, if it's just more or less isolated to the knee, then it's probably your joint. Great. Next question is my hip hurts only at night. When I sleep, I have to keep turning from one side to the other. I haven't had them checked yet. Could this be arthritis? I just had a bone density test and I was told I have osteopenia. Uh, hard to say. Uh, you, you would think you'd have some pain daytime too, uh, but that could be a presentation if you've been really active during the day and at night you're not distracted. You're you're trying to sleep and you're not you know your mind is not occupied with other things and so you feel that ache and pain uh, a lot more at night sometimes. So it, it could be early uh, arthritis type symptoms. All right. Um... Next uh, question is, in a not so smart move, I lowered my bicycle seat too close to the pedal. My knee doesn't hurt, but something gets stuck on the inner left of one knee, mostly when walking uphill. I have to stop and flex my leg and then continue walking. Any idea what this could be? Mm, it could be a meniscus tear. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, like a, the meniscal cartilage, uh, the half moon shaped cartilages in the knee. You have a tear of that, you can have a, a piece that flips over and gets pinched in the joint space. And it's, it's gonna bother you with certain movements like that. Um, so it's possible that it could be a meniscus tear. Um, the other option would be like a, a, a tendonitis of the, of the uh, uh, IT band or the, the tendons around the knee. Okay, <clears throat> next question is just a couple more. Um, hi, sometimes when I kick a soccer ball and my knee is fully extended, I get a very sharp localized pain on the posterior part of my knee. 
The pain does not run up and down, but it is very localized to the posterior knee and it gets worse when jumping. What kind of imaging could help figure out the source of the pain? Uh, well, I'll start with x-rays and then get an MRI. Because an MRI will show the soft tissues. Probably what you'd be looking for is a, a meniscus tear, or the posterior horn of the meniscus, uh, or a, a, a tendon that's damaged potentially. But uh, I, I, you know, if, if, if it doesn't get better, uh, normally we can just give things a lot of times a chance to get better. If it's just a matter of a few days or a few weeks or a month or two, you might wait, see if it doesn't get better. But if it's something that's chronic ongoing, then uh, I would probably get an MRI to, to find out. Great. <clears throat> Next one is, I've heard that hip injections are more complicated than knee injections and are done using an x-ray and are painful. Is that accurate? Uh, that, yeah, knees are easy. We do them in the office. Uh, doesn't require any, any special imaging. Hips are a little trickier because it's a deeper socket. You've got the, uh, the uh, nerves and vessels uh, in the front of the hip that you have to avoid. And to get the needle in the joint, be sure you're in the joint, you need to do it under imaging. Uh, some people will do it under ultrasound uh, or fluoroscopy, which is uh, x-ray. And that ten, tends to be done in uh, an x-ray suite. Uh, and it, it, it is a little more painful. Usually they'll use a, a local anesthesia. It's a little deeper uh, type of injection. So probably a little more uncomfortable, but I don't think it's a lot more uncomfortable, but I, I, I think I already shared my philosophy on the injections in the hip. I don't think they do a whole lot. You know, I, I don't use, use them that often. And the other thing, one of my concerns about injecting the hip is, and it needs too, like uh, cortisone inhibits your white cell response. That's how it reduces the inflammation. And your white cell response is a protection against infection. So there is literature that's, that's, that says, if we've done an injection, say in the hip or in the knee, then we should, with cortisone, and then we ultimately wanna do surgery, you need to wait you know, up to six months sometimes uh, before we do surgery, because we don't want that cortisone effect to be there, which is inhibiting your defense against infection. Uh, and so I, I just don't see that much benefit in the hips typically, except for special circumstances. And with the risk of infection, I don't, I, you know, I, uh, especially if you're going to anticipate being doing surgery, I, I don't do it very much. Right. Um, last couple questions here. I had an epidural in my back two weeks ago. The back pain hurts more consistently now than before, which had been intermittent. How likely is it that I'll be pain free going forward? It's been two weeks. Yes, it's two weeks. Yeah, hard to say. I mean, by two weeks, you should have a benefit. So I'm not sure it was successful. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question I've got here is, um, do you always use a local for knee surgery? It kind of scares me to be unconscious. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the standard of uh, what we do most of the time is a spinal and the nerve blocks with local anesthesia. So you are not under a general anesthetic. You're semi-awake. I mean, they'll give you something to kind of make you sleepy and you might doze off, but you're not under general anesthetic. And if you want to be uh, less an anesthetized, you can just tell your anesthesiologist you want to be a little bit more awake. And so he, he uh, will uh, let you stay awake as long as you're not trying to do the surgery. <laughs> well, uh, one last question popped up here. Um, I have knee pain when walking down the stairs, but no problem going up the stairs. Walking is also without pain. Is this typical and what could be going on? Yes, walking downstairs is, is more aggravating than going upstairs. People with knee pain are gonna feel it more going down than up, especially if it's the patellofemoral joint, if it's the, you know, your kneecap portion of the uh, joint. It's really more bothersome to go downstairs than upstairs.